Who are you? I am the monster's mother. I think people keep making alien movies in a way because unconsciously I'm convinced people actually are as dis disappointed as I am in filmmakers' inability to match the quality of the first one. Obviously, we wanted to do something different. I mean, Jean-Pierre wanted to take off, you know, to do something really different from the three first ones. And he took this, this way of, you know, like a, the dark comedy. We read their script and we thought, well, this is just going to ruin this franchise. This is just, this just doesn't work at all. The first thing I said, it was, why you want to hire me? I don't want to make a, a Hollywood movie. And it was exactly the thing they, they wanted to, to hear. I got involved uh, with Alien when um, Jorge Saralegui at Fox wanted very much to revive the, the franchise and he knew my work and thought, you know, that maybe I could write a treatment that would interest the, the brass. So I did. I wrote a treatment and they said, this is interesting, we'd like, we'd like maybe to make this, but um, you have to put Sigourney Weaver in it um, because originally she had been dead. I did think Alien 3 was definitely the end. There was never any talk, at least not that, I, that, that we were privy to, that, that there was a plan, that was ever a plan to go anywhere else with the movie, because it was so definitive with the end of Ripley. Ripley is the, the, the conduit to the whole series, so once she's taken out of the picture, there is, there's no point in, in still investigating that, that storyline without her. And I do remember seeing, uh, there's a feeling of, of, of finality to it. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a great scene when she finally, you know, kills herself and it's it's a moment of uh, becomes a moment of, of sacrifice to be able to take that queen embryo and, and and take it into the fire with her so that just seemed very uh, very definitive we were very surprised to to get a call years later and say it's gonna be an alien four you know we opposed alien four actually uh, Walter and I um, we tried to stop them from making we did we um, we didn't like their, they, they developed their script the script on their own um, from an idea that was kind of ours, but uh, you know, I, I told Sigourney at the Alien Three party, she said, it feels kind of bad to be you know out of this movie completely, you know, out of the franchise. What are you talking about? You know, I can see them going to a drawer and pulling out some old fingernails and cloning you and your back. Don't worry about it. <laughs> oh yeah, she's okay. It's always easy, you know. I, I I do believe that you should end a film with finality and deal with the sequel later, because there's a million ways to to revive a. a a, a, a franchise, you know. So it wasn't really of much concern to me, but uh, I was obviously happy when they called us and told us that Alien was being resurrected. They asked for an Alien movie, which to them means a certain thing, and it's certain, you know, scary like Alien, exciting like Aliens, you know. Um, but uh, but beyond let's bring Ripley back, there was no sort of guideline. Um, so I was naturally terrified and helpless for many months. I remember sort of sitting in, in one of the execs' offices and, and they said they were writing the script and I was stunned, frankly, because one of the reasons I died was really to liberate this series um, from Ripley, because I didn't want her to keep waking up, you know, oh my God, there's a monster on board. You know, I, I didn't want her to become like this figure of fun, you know that no one ever listened to, you know, and kept waking up in these terrible places. One situation worse than the next. So for the sake of the series, and also because I heard they were gonna do Alien versus Predator or something that I thought was just sounded awful, I wanted out. They told me they were writing a new draft and that I'd be very, um, I would find it very provocative how I was brought back. The challenge is finding a clever way to bring back a person who died at the end of the film that doesn't seem corny. Um, to convince people that she is back without making it seem too easy. Um, so, you know, I went back and forth with a lot of different things, but ultimately it seemed that I had to clone her. It suddenly focuses on this particular um, phenomenon in a very personal way, I think, because it's Ripley, she's back, and there are things about her that she doesn't understand. Um, but the more I worked on it, the more the movie became about the idea of bringing somebody back from the dead. And as difficult as it was for me as a writer, it's 10 times more difficult for Ripley as a character. 
something has gone wrong in the cloning and so that she's had a sort of genetic mix with the alien and so throughout the picture there's this I think unease about how much she is of which and where her loyalties lie. The soul of the piece is her process of waking up, finding out she's alive and finding out who she is and if she's what she was and, and if not, is she still strictly human? I think so much of it is original while the spirit of it is very much a cross between the first and second. The great part of the script is that we get them out of space and, and we are moving toward Earth and I think uh, that, that that gives a focus to the film and an urgency to the film that some of the other that the other aliens may not have had. The script is amazing. I mean, it's really, really, um, the ideas in it are very moving, actually. I mean, um, having the, the alien be, you know, the, the daughter of or the son of Ripley and this whole kind of generational thing, and then eventually there's grandchildren running around, you know. Um, and, and my character, uh, my character's history and what you find out about my character, the big, is really, you know, is actually very kind of touching. So really, I read the first draft by Joss Whedon. I thought it was amazing. When I wrote it, I wanted to make the character kind of strange and edgy, and I was afraid that Sigourney would say, can't we make her pretty and, you know, and likable, and can she have a puppy? And she just kept saying, push it further. What if I'm even stranger? What if I have more alien and less human in me? And, and um, she, she created an extraordinary character. I was quite seduced by it, the fact that Winona had already committed to it. Uh, everything but the director was sort of there like a year before we started shooting. I really like flipped out when they, they, I remember the day that they brought it up to me, you know, and I just, you know, they said, well, they found, they figured out a way to bring her back, to bring Ripley back, and, and that they wanted me to play another character in it, and it was just like, and, you know, they were tentative. They thought I was going to go, are you crazy? I'm, you know, but it, but it was like it, it, the opposite. I mean, I, I, I love these kind of movies. Because it was a good script, because this regime at the studio is very um, committed and they're very proud of the Alien series and they weren't going to just rip off the Alien series and make a lot of money. They really see that the reason the series seems to work is that they always pick a very good, brilliant young director who takes the alien elements and makes them his own. Every story needs, you know, somebody to latch on to and um, the difference between a good and a bad horror movie is whether or not you care about the people believe in and care about the people in it. Ripley is so much the anchor for the Alien series and we've gone through so much with her and in the fourth one she goes through something completely different. She is, she has changed. She's not the Ripley she was and um, she is absolutely the center of the film and what works in the film works because of her, because of us relating to her experience of it. It was a big script in Hollywood. It was one of the, one of the, uh, the buzz about it was that it, it had some things that made it a worthwhile, um, um, a, a worthwhile successor to all of these others. And you know, there had been some kind of a fall off, I think, um, with the third, uh, the third movie for whatever reason. I, you know, I, I like them all. I'm a huge fan, but. Um, there had been a fall off, and, and I think that the whole reason Sigourney got involved in this fourth one beca was because the script was so good. Each one of the movies is, is its own. I mean, Alien is very different from Aliens, which is very different from, from the third. Um, but as a fan, as somebody who grew up with the Alien movie, it's my responsibility is to scare myself and excite myself as much as possible. And then to be true to the lore and the sort of how these things gestate and, and how everything works without corrupting that so that the real diehard fans can appreciate how much further we've taken it without corrupting it, and then people who've never seen it can just have a great, you know, scary, exciting time. So we, you know, we read their script and we thought, well, this is just gonna ruin this franchise. This is just, this just doesn't work at all. Um, and um, they insisted on making it and they went ahead and, you know, God, they have Alien 4. They have theirs, we have ours. <laughs> Thank you.
we received the script, um, which was pretty much the shooting script for Alien Resurrection. There was not a whole lot of changes, some sort of set piece changes and things like that, but pretty much the script that we got was the script that was shot. Um, there was uh, originally talk of Danny Boyle, who did uh, Train Spotting, uh, directing it. Again, a great, great choice, great idea. Um, and I can't. We met with him uh, and his producer. Um, I, I don't. I don't know what the circumstances were and why he opted not to do it. But then Jean Pierre Jeunet came in, and um, we hit it off with him immediately. He's such a great visual storyteller. And he appreciates everything that we do, and you know he's an artist, so you know he loves the sculpture and the design aspects of of all this stuff. And um, we just had a, a terrific working relationship with him. From an effects point of view, it sounded huge what they were trying to do. And uh, it was shortly thereafter that we met uh, Jean Pierre Jeunet, and and just immediately had a real strong feeling that this is a guy that 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 could pull this off from having seen. Uh, uh, Delicatessen was the only film I was familiar with at the time that he had done, and knowing that he has such a such a, a, a specific visual style, um, and I think that's what the what the studio was so excited about having him involved. It was going to be a whole different take, you know, on the Alien um, series to go in with that kind of vision as opposed to what had been done before. When I first heard that Jean Pierre had been brought onto the project, I was kind of surprised because the lineage of the Aliens you know, is such an illustrious, you know, group of people from Ridley Scott to James Cameron to David Fincher. And so, you know, the, my first thought was, well, who is this Jean-Pierre Jeunet guy? And then, of course, having seen City of Lost Children, I kind of <laughs> put, uh, put that issue to rest because certainly one of the strongest visualists I've ever seen. When you look at his films, you really come to understand that he is one of the few directors that has a real unusual point of view uh, and a different eye. It's like he has a third eye, and he sees things visually very differently than other people. And he will take something, put a spin on it, then put a spin on that. Uh, and I, I think there is a, a quality of uniqueness about his vision that doesn't exist uh, with a lot of directors. I could tell from his pictures that if he wanted to do it, you know, uh, if he had a passion about the alien movies, um, that he would be great because he had a lot of the qualities you I think you need I mean I have a very peculiar slant on what I think you need to direct these pictures and I, I thought he'd be terrific I remember I thought it's not a good idea to to make sequels <laughs> and when they called me I, I, I thought it's finished the, the series finished now I actually had the interesting experience of, of meeting with him on the day he landed in Los Angeles. He hadn't had his first meeting with Fox yet. And I remember distinctly him saying, I have no idea why me, you know. At this time, I, I was writing Amelie. And uh, when I, I went to the studio to, to meet the, 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 the executive producer, I, the first thing I said, it was, why you want to hire me? I, I am busy. I don't want to make a, a Hollywood movie. And it was exactly the thing they, they wanted to, to hear, you know? <laughs> he just couldn't understand what they'd seen in his films um, that made someone at Fox say, let's get this guy. Um, but he was honored by it. He just couldn't understand it. I think if they hired me, I suppose, and they told me, because I had some weird ideas, and they saw it in The City of Lost Children, I knew special effects and this kind of thing, but in first, because I was able to bring some ideas. And in fact, I brought a lot of ideas and they kept it, except when it was too expensive. I mean, basically, I, I met him as he was getting off the plane. He said, we need to talk again in a few days after I know if I've got the job or not. Um, and when I spoke to him maybe a week later or something like that, at that point he started talking about um, his understanding of the Fox agenda. But what was more important to him, I think, was his own. And I think his agenda was, for me, this is exactly the same as taking on um, a commercial, except it's going to be a very long one. But what he meant by that is that he was completely willing to come in as a hired hand, whose talent was obviously respected by Fox. But I think he understood his, his job to really be um, helping the studio do exactly what they had in mind for the franchise. 
And it was clear in his mind. He was like, we're going to listen to what they want. They're going to tell us whom they want. And they already knew by that time that Sigourney Weaver and uh, Winona Ryder were in the film. It was presumably um, part of some package, at least prior to Jean-Pierre being on the film. And I think they um, already had a script written, which was very close to the script that we ended up working on. It was so an amazing adventure to make a big Hollywood movie. And Alien, it's a nice series. I, I couldn't say no, I remember. He really wanted to be part of the game. He didn't want to be an outsider. The cliche in France is when you work in Hollywood, you are not free. You, and in fact, uh, the, the, the first surprise for me, I was free in terms of artistic direction. And in terms of money, it was exactly the opposite. They wanted to, to, to keep in first the schedule and to save money. And I can understand because, you know, this kind of movie could be so expensive with the, the huge sets, with everything. But I was free and they accept all the ideas. And I, I brought a lot of ideas. It was very important for me because it was the first time I didn't write the script myself. Um, Jean-Pierre and I spent some time refining script and figuring out what the climax was going to look like. Um, and, uh, and of course, he brought his Jean-Pierre-ness to it. Um, but, uh, but we didn't uh, alter it much. Everything worked except the ending. It was a big problem with the ending. We wrote maybe five different endings. Uh, we really just took out the things that are too expensive to shoot, <laughs> which I tend to write occasionally. During the storyboard, because I, I made a, a very nice storyboard, I, it was a role of the game for me to bring one idea per scene, and I did. Jean-Pierre, when I first met him, was extremely charming and uh, seemed very creative and artistic and uh, eccentric and very, very French, which was rather, it was in Los Angeles, so it was very refreshing. Uh, there was a slight conflict with his Frenchness and his creativity clashing with, you know, the hard-boiled Hollywood machine, and that did cause problems on the film. But on the whole, he was an extremely nice and charming man. I liked him a lot. He basically had brought over some of his key players uh, from France. He had Darius Conji, who's a cinematographer who shot Seven at the time, and Stealing Beauty is a fantastic cinematographer. Um, he'd brought his editor, Hervé Schneid, who had also worked on all of his movies. There was Pitoff, who's, who's the special effects director, supervisor, I guess, from uh, Dubois, with his, his whole French crew. The deal with, uh, uh, with Fox and Jean-Pierre was to, uh, uh, to, uh, to, to give to Jean-Pierre anything he needed to, uh, to do his job and to, uh, to be comfortable with, with, with his crew. And so that's why he asked me to, uh, to come in, in L.A. And then so I brought my people uh, from Paris to, uh, to do um, a big part of, of the uh, visual effects. For a cinematographer, it's, um, it's, a very, it's a great thing to work with him. It's, uh, he's very exciting, very exciting person to work with. For, he, he really appreciates uh, a, really a, a lot the visuals. He creates a lot. He's, uh, you know, he's like one of these very visual director, like uh, Roman Polanski or or Bernard Bertucci, he really appreciates the look of the film, the, the lighting, he appreciates the, the camera, the, the composition. He's very involved in it and, uh, and he's fun to work with. He's, uh, he's not somebody who is, uh, he's, he's really great, great fun to work with. I made two films with Darius Kanji before and it's very like this, you know, we, it's not necessary to, to, to speak a, a, lot, a lot with Darius. Uh, he's one of those um, directors that um, knows exactly how we're going to shoot it. I mean, I don't bring much in terms of uh, angle, the choice of angles. He, he usually, um, he usually give it, you know, he, he give me an angle that he likes, uh, this certain distance between the face, the, the actors and the camera, certain angle, a certain vision of the, the scene. And then he give it to me to fine tune it, to make it, you know, better. and then he gives me the freedom on, uh, he, he, Jean-Pierre always gave me a lot of freedom on lighting, on the creation of, of the mood. He is the prince of darkness, Darius Conji. He loves when it's very dark. And I, I thought, okay, it's, it's pretty okay for uh, this kind of movie because we don't want to see um, a lot of the, the, the monsters. One, one of the really school of lighting for me, one of the film um, with like the conformist, uh, um, Last Tango and uh, 1900 movies like that, 
one of the film in the list of the films that where I li really learned a lot, I think, watching them all over, over and over again, once the DVD and um, tapes and came out of these films, was Alien, the first Alien. For me, it's really like a, how do you say, milestone you know, in, um, in the horror films and uh, also in, the, um, in design, in the way movies are designed and photographed. What Jean-Pierre was about was his infinite respect for the art direction of the first Alien movie. It was so new. Uh, the monster was so scaring. It was so a good idea to, to hire Giger for the monster. And it was new because the ship, very old, with age, with, uh, you know, the dust and very, very um, not clean, it was pretty new. He also wanted, that was one of his agendas, was to, um, to really match the, the savvy of, of typical Hollywood movies. I don't think he wanted to come to America to do a, a sort of Frenchy goes to Hollywood film. And one of the things he did as soon as he landed was rent a bunch of videotapes or DVDs or whatever people were watching at the time. So we watch these things uh, uh, a lot with Jean-Pierre. Of course, we watch all the aliens. <clears throat> I remember we uh, were going to his house uh, regularly and watching uh, other movies, other science fiction, other science, science, uh, science fiction movies, and especially the the three first Alien that were all interesting for different reasons. Even though my really favorite one was the first one, which for me was a really like a masterpiece. And I remember he carefully watched a lot of those movies and counted the camera setups, and he even obtained production reports on some of these films, including on the first Alien, because I'll never forget that the actual um, camera setup count for Ridley's Alien was around 859 or 60 shots. Let's say maximum 900 setups. Um, as opposed to something like um, a typical summer action movie back in 1996 had, I think, a, a head count around 1,600 setups or something to that extent. And he was very conscious of that and decided to really raise the amount of shots. He really, really wanted to, to match the rhythm and, and the, the sort of um, heightened tension that typical summer movies would have in America. Wanted to see what was good, what was not as uh, interesting in the first ones, and, for, for, and how we could uh, uh, really make the, the whole thing, uh, make an evolution, you know, create uh, something, make the, the, the creature d d different, you know. I think it was very important to keep the Giger style, and the studio didn't want to, to work with him for a question of money, I suppose, but for me, it was very important to, to keep the, the style of Giger. And I, I said to the crew, uh, I bought the book of Giger, and I, I gave them to the, all the crew. Because it's, uh, the, the, the three movies were so strong, then you can't, you know, you can't, you're sort of obliged to be in the same mood, because the mood is good. Anyway, the mood is very good, and Giger is really at the beginning of this. So Giger gave the, uh, his sort of print uh, uh, on, 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 on the on, on, on the Syria, and then uh, when you're making a, 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 a sequel like this, anyway, the uh, it's the character of, of the alien is so strong, then I don't think there's a lot of uh, different way to, to make it. And then you 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 give your own sensibility on on, on the character and, and the story, and when you are like Jean Pierre with a very strong uh, world and strong vision, then uh, it's you make your own. But you. Ha you're obliged to have in mind what the other guys did before. So he went, he went, uh, he took this, this way of, you know, like also the, the dark comedy, you know, almost, which was uh, interesting, I think, for the fourth one. Uh, I can't avoid humor because I love to make to do the humor, you know. And uh, I was a little bit worried about that because I thought, is it okay on a, in an alien movie? In fact, I, I called Marc Caro and I said, they asked me to make an alien, what do you think? And he, I suppose he didn't believe they are going to, to hire me, you know? <laughs> and he, he told me, 
if I could be f completely free, I am okay. But it's not the case. I don't care because you know he is very, and I understood he's not ready for Hollywood. There was no distinction as to who did what. It's a little bit like the Wachowski brothers. You know, nobody's actually sort of stopped the clock to say, okay, who did what. Um, for a long time, people talked about Powell Pressburger without anybody knowing for sure how much Pressburger, you know, intervened. And I think. Um, I think Carl and Genet were a little bit like that. It was, it was um, a sort of two-headed entity. And I got the sense that at the time that Jean-Pierre was offered the job, um, basically they were, they were both offered the job. But I think Carl turned it down. He's very radical. I love that about Carl, that he's extremely uh, radical and he's uh, constantly, he constantly wants more uh, in the, in, the, in the look, in the design, design of it. He wants, he's very, very perfectionist to the obsession. <laughs> so I think they talked about it, and I think um, Gao said, why don't you go it alone on this one, because I don't think that, uh, that they'll let me do my sort of turn of the century Jules Verne style of, of, of art direction, and if I can't have that, I'm not really interested. Um, which was probably a good call. Chances are they, they didn't want that, you know. And Jean-Pierre said, fine. So he flew over to Los Angeles to meet the guys. But um, because they were buddies, he said, why don't you come out and still do some designs for me, which Caro did. He came out for about three weeks in June, I think, of 96, and um, did some, some paintings of costumes, which were then adapted um, into actual costume designs by the costume department. When I actually really arrived on the on the preparation of a picture, there were some drawings, some inspiration, I think, for the costumes that were coming from Caro. But Caro is such a, uh, uh, you know, a really interesting, uh, really like a genius of, uh, of conceptual uh, of design and things, you know. Caro is an amazing uh, a person for, for uh, twisting things, for, uh, you know, breaking things, making things like really uh, things that you haven't seen that makes it very exciting. At the first meeting with Jean-Pierre, we talked about the con his concepts, of it, his basic concepts for the, for the movie. And he'd brought some drawings that he and his associate, Marc Corot, had done in Paris. Uh, just they were very basic conceptual ideas. And he showed them. And he said, uh, ignore these drawings, but I want you to see them so that you know how we've been thinking about it. And I did take some of the ideas from them. And, um, and then I invented a lot of my own. And uh, Although when the book of the making of the film came out, I wasn't mentioned, and Mark Crow was credited with everything, which did piss me off rather a lot. <laughs> uh, Caro is a very big fan of mine, as uh, Jean-Pierre, and I know them from, from, from the beginning. The first time I, I met Jean-Pierre was, uh, uh, was on, on the Harry. I was so a uh, Harry uh, operator, and uh, he came uh, to see me uh, for music videos because he has, he has uh, some problems. Uh, with the face of the actress, yeah, to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, so some stuff to, uh, to, to get rid of, so it was kind of funny. Yeah. And, and Caro, I, I, um, I did all his uh, 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 short films and music videos and commercials, and uh, yes, it's my family. I mean, on the two first films that I did with Jean-Pierre, Delicatessen and uh, City of Lost Children, the impact of Caro was, uh, was huge in the... Um, in the mood. He came to, 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 to do some sketches for the costume and uh, during two weeks, but you know, he doesn't drive and he doesn't like sun. It's, uh, LA is a worse city for Mark Caro. Caro knew that because he tended to have more of, of the sort of art direction responsibilities, and Jean-Pierre Genet had more of the, the director's responsibility, dealing with the actors, dealing with, with the actual framing of the shots, if you like. Um, I think that Caro sort of knew that he would have a very hard time working in an American studio environment. And that's sort of a reaction that you'd get out of most typical French, you know, filmmakers, uh, or would-be filmmakers, is they're, they, they like, it's a pride issue, I think, they like to act as if they're very suspicious of the American studio system, as if they've got it figured out or something. And I think he just didn't want to be part of it. He just didn't want to have, um, the, the sort of size, the, the bigness of what his idea of an American studio is hovering over him. Whereas Jean-Pierre welcomed the opportunity because um, he's trained as a commercial director and he's, he's got that whole part of his personality licked and he had it for a long time. 
he knows how to be um, very efficient and how to be a, a good businessman where needed. And for him, that wasn't a problem. Maybe because from the beginning, I wanted to stay friend with the studio. I wanted to stay positive, and I, I, I did. And now I am, I am friend with Tom Rothman, Roy Saraghi, and um, Peter Rice, and Bill Mechanic. I stay friend with them, and it was a very nice adventure. It wasn't easy every day because, you know, in first they want to keep the schedule and to save money, as I said. But it's a strange game because they push you to, to save money, and on the other hand, they are very happy when they have the quality. And it's, it's a strange game. Sometimes you have to fight, to struggle against the studio, for the studio. It's weird. But that's Hollywood, I suppose. Oddly enough, that whole experience sort of showed Jean-Pierre who he was in their relationship and showed Carol who Jean-Marc Carol was in that relationship. And I, although I think they still meet on a regular basis, I'm not convinced that they actually um, will ever work together again. I would have loved to have uh, uh, more input of uh, Caro, but we had also great production designer that uh, we discovered on this film with uh, Nigel Phelps, who was uh, in, like the, one of the best news of the film. I, it was the first time I worked with Nigel, and um, he did, uh, I think he did an incredible work of, uh, of design um, of the spaceship, of the, of the hallways, the, the, you know, the way it was, uh, all design. Nigel had um, worked carefully with Darius Kanji in designing the film so that the lighting was integrated into the set. And basically every design Nigel was doing was, was intending to um, give opportunities for actual practical lights to be fitted into the set beneath little layers and grids and, and little holes that created rhythms of light. So that when you actually walked through the set lit, um, it was already lit for the film. You, there's nothing to do. You just walk through, and, and Darius had already worked out with Nigel exactly where the lights were going. Basically, we look. We did a lot of research looking at films, and then we uh, had a lot of meetings. Um, on the, uh, at the same time, we had meetings uh, all the, all the way along with uh, Nigel and Jean Pierre, the three of us, uh, especially the three of us, were um, thinking about the, the how you know how we would design things, how. We, how we would make an evolution of the, the tension on the film with the lights, with the, the, the practical lights, with all the siren lights, you know, the red, the, how do you say, the black, black police lights, the, with search lights, with things like this. And we made a big, um, um, like, like a big preparation on this. Nigel came up with very complex sets. They were very, you know, they were very like um, Chinese puzzles, the, the spaceships and everything, all the way they were slotted together. At the time, I think Nigel had done Judge Dredd, and I think Fox um, went to, went to Jean-Pierre and said, we'd like you to look at some of the people we're thinking about. Um, so when I said um, Nigel had done Judge Dredd, that's what he'd done as a production designer, but he'd actually worked for many years as Anton First's assistant. And as such, he'd worked on movies like Full Metal Jacket and Batman. Nigel Febs, I, I met this guy, he's so close to, to me. When he brought me the first sketches, uh, it was for Batman, I think. And it was exactly a, a kind of continuity of the harbor of the city of children. And, uh, I had a very good relationship with him, and Sylvain Desprez was uh, one of the, of the crew of Niger. Fox was apparently hugely proud of their set because they used to just wheel everyone through that area. It just would bring everybody, stars, people they were trying to impress, God knows who, people were just constantly, constantly walking through and just admiring, and it, it was beautiful. You had to scratch the paint off the walls to accept that it wasn't rusted metal. I mean, every detail, every bolt. This is the way Nigel works. It's like everything was meticulously looked at. The, the sets were built um, a few stages apart from one another at Fox in America. I remember it was pretty difficult to find some stages, but at this time, the question, no question, it was Los Angeles. They didn't shoot it in England because I think Sigourney Weaver didn't want to travel. It was as simple as that. You know, she, she lives in New York. I think she wanted to go to Los Angeles for the, whatever, the period of the shoot, which was maybe October, November through February of the following year, something like that. And she didn't want to be too far away. So everybody basically decided to shoot the film in LA. All the pictures have been really hard to do. They've all been rough 
really hard on the crews. Um, in England, especially where we always did them, we worked till like 11 o'clock every night. We worked Saturdays, and it was really lousy. Um, we made good movies, but the, I, I don't like to see the crew exhausted. I think it's dangerous for this kind of movie. It was difficult to find uh, empty stages, because, uh, available stages, because it was a lot of big movies at this time, uh, Starship Troopers and The Lost World, if I remember, and Titanic, and a lot, a lot of films. And I remember it was a story, a funny story. Um, the Fox Studio weren't available because uh, the wife of Robert Murdoch wanted to make a uh, sell, charity sale in a stage. <laughs> <laughs> and at the end, we, we got the, the stages. And I was very happy because I didn't want to shoot in bad uh, in location. I, I, I prefer to shoot at Fox. Even it was a construction site at this time. I was very proud to, to shoot at Fox. I remember each morning when I passed the gate, I was so proud. You know. It was a good surprise because uh, I was pretty free in terms of casting. The studio didn't want to, to say, you have to hire this guy. Never. They respect me. There was a last minute thing. Um, uh, from what I heard, uh, Jean-Pierre, who's the director, had seen pretty much everybody else in town. He well, didn't want to see me, and Rick Brigano sneaked me in there. We're at the bottom of the ship. We have to go through the kitchen, maybe 90 feet, to the freight elevator shaft at the other side. And uh, they were just a, like a week, two weeks before they were gonna start shooting. And it, it sort of fell into my lap, yeah. So first of all, you have the meeting, I have an audition, a screen test like this, camera set up in a room similar to this, you read through, uh, he, uh, he, he directs you, um, he, you can tell that he is responding to you, and then at the end of the meeting he says, do you know how to swim? So that's a good sign, I think my own recipe. I had worked with Jean-Pierre um, on City of Lost Children, and, um, uh, you know, he, he fought for me for the role of a genre from the moment he got hired. I know the, the guy by heart. I remember for the city, we try, I tried to, to do some re rehearsal, and I brought Ron Perlman in Normandy, in my house in Normandy, to rehearse. And in fact, we played pool all the night. <laughs> and in LA, we played pool too. <laughs> My personal experience, I mean, this was a walk in the park compared to City of Lost Children because that was a picture where I was the only non-Frenchman on the set. I mean, I was the only non, that was, a, that was a French film made in France, in Paris, with an entirely French production crew, staff, uh, and, uh, I mean, I was really the odd man out. I was, I was the one who was getting looked at like, what's his problem? Earth man, what a shithole. I think part of the reason why Jean-Pierre might have wanted me around was because this was gonna be his first, his first fish out of water experience. He had made all his movies, you know, where he was cocooned and nurtured and felt very comfortable. And here he was coming to the United States uh, to, you know, not only work in a foreign kind of a, an environment, but on a big, big studio film, which was part of a franchise, a kind of a storied franchise, and had an iconic kind of um, a permutation to it. So um, I think he wanted to be surrounded by as many people as he was comfortable with as possible. Dominic Pino plays in all my films and he's going to play in the next one. And for me, it's that the, the perfect actor. He's so inventive, so nice, so perfect. I, I think Jean-Pierre wanted me to be part of that show, and uh, he, was, he was going to ask the Fox to uh, hire me. <laughs> Alien, it was amazing for me to, to bring this actor in stage because Sigourney Weaver and the studio asked me to have Dominic Pino. Jean-Pierre told me the Fox already thought of me for, for the part. When I, I told to Dominique, they want to work with you, he didn't believe me. He said, oh, it's a joke, believe it. <laughs> and at the end, he is in the film, it's, uh, it's marvelous.
Winona Ryder. Everything was so easy for her, so easy. I remember one day, a newborn, the new alien wasn't finished. And I tried to explain to her the appearance of the new alien. Um, Winona, I'm going to tell you, he's white, he's tall, big, very impressive, and he's going to make, ooh, ooh. and she looked at me and said, okay, Jean-Pierre, it's not necessary to explain to me. Tell me just faster or slower, it's necessary, you know. The expressions, um, the ex expressiveness of, of the newborn, it, it's one of the most frightening, but yet you feel for this. It, it's a real character in the movie, you, you understand. It's not, it's, not a, uh, it's not an alien, it's like a real character. And she did a, a kind of uh, different expressions and everything was perfect at the ed editing room. She's so professional, so easy. As a, as a fan, I, I really, like I was trying to steal things constantly. I have like alien goo at my house and of course, you know, I mean I have like action dolls of, from the alien movies. I'm like a real collector. Well, you gonna kill me or what? You know Sigourney Weaver is uh, the only person working on the four alien. And when I met her for the first time during a walking session, uh, I understood very quickly she's, she knows exactly what she, she is going to, to make. And at this time, I, I, my job consists to modify the script, to, to put some new ideas, just to help her. Because I've actually lived each of these films, the history is sort of inside me. I think the way it must be in her. So I don't try to, I mean, this film was especially interesting because I, in a sense, am a different person, very, very different, um, completely different, I would say. And there's a, something about Ripley's nature in, in this particular film that makes everything a different perspective. Um, how she relates to humans, how she relates to aliens, how she relates to being in space, why she might want to go to Earth. All these things are like brand new. And it's not just like a paycheck job for her. I mean, she really, like, really cares about the series and really cares about Ripley and how she's portrayed. And she had just stacks and stacks of notebooks that she kept from the first movie for like 20 years. You know, she had these stacks of notebooks and she, you know, everything had to make sense. Every move that Ripley made, she would, you know, go and make sure that it made sense. I, did, I didn't direct Sigourney, but I modify everything to, to, to go on her way. You know what I mean? And she was happy. And me too. It's about her and it's about, you know, this, uh, this woman survivor, you know? People, you know, root for her. And then she's a woman, and a strong woman, and how many strong women characters are out there? Because that's the thing that makes that, that, that the series of films so identifiable, is that female character, that strong female character. <laughs> she needed to, to have a director very close to her, not very far away behind a, con uh, a monitor. She hates that but very close to, the, to the, the actor. And I remember, I, I will remember all my life when after the take, uh, when she looked at me and just to, to have a confirmation. And it wasn't necessary to discuss, just one look and we knew if we had the best take. There was one scene in, in, in the film where she's attached to these, uh, these handcuffs and they were specially made and there's no give in these handcuffs, they're solid metal. And she has to break out of these things. She has to break a chain, a steel cord. And uh, every time she did it, she had to come up against it. And there was no padding. There was no anything. And she hit the end, and she'd pull it all the way out, and she'd get out. And then she'd, they'd yell cut, and then she'd cry. She had to play this superwoman, this invincible. And they'd be ready to roll again, and she'd do it again. And she cried. She came off that set that afternoon. Her wrists, you know, 
I really got along with all the actors really well. It was really a great uh, feeling of camaraderie, and certainly Sigourney was used to it because she had done that before, but I wasn't used to working with actors on that level where we were all running. It's like you, you really have to uh, you really have to be bonded with everyone. And everyone was just really, really excited to be in the movie. I mean, every actor was like, I can't believe, can you believe that we're in this movie? You know, it was like the big thing on the set. And it's, it's, it's very cool to be a part of as an actor, you know. You, you, you completely commit to what your character is going through and, and feeling and, 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 and bring to life uh, whatever the writer and director's um, fantasy may be. I guess what appealed to me about Gediman was a problem I have in my own life. Being an actor, especially a character actor, is a very insecure life. And you don't always get to do what you want. But I guess the reason why I've held on is that I've come to the realization of how much I really love it. And that's the thing about Gediman that I like, is that he really loves what he does. No! Get away from me! It's great because we can come up with things and, and we get to work as an ensemble a little bit to come up with something and see if it works. Jean-Pierre likes it, then we'll use it. So it's, it's a little bit more creative. It's not set in stone what exactly we're going to do. Action! Since we are kind of like this ship that's together as uh, pirates or something, it, it looks, uh, looks better when you have a... Uh, when we hang out together behind the scenes, it makes it easier when we're in front of the camera to make it look more natural. We were trying to, uh, we're trying, uh, uh, me and uh, Ron talk a lot about the first alien and how Harry Dean Stanton and Yafit Koto, how the repertoire they had together. It was, it was cool. Uh, it was just like two oil rig guys, you know, and you really believe their relationship to one another and that they were just doing it for the money or that they were just, Working, working guys, blue collar dudes, you know. It can get very tense on a, on a picture like that because there's 120 people who are called upon to make every particular moment happen, you know, in a very concerted and coordinated way. And uh, so it was a perfect combination of all the bells and whistles of big time movie making along with the most degenerate bunch of actors you've ever seen in one place, you know, who were, kept cutting through the tension. We had a lot of fun, <laughs> and that's 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 what you're afraid of when you're starting a movie. You know, you just don't know how you're going to get along with the others. We would joke around in between scenes, and you had to be careful you didn't pick up on those intonations when you were actually shooting. Sometimes we had to be separated. We, I mean, you know, we had. You're gonna stand over there now, and you're gonna you 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 two cannot talk to each other for the rest of the day, okay? Because we're trying to work here, so it was fun, and it was, it was I've stayed friends with a lot of the guys, which is rare also. Good people. No, we just had a lot of fun, you know. We just had a lot of fun. I made some good friends on that movie. We had, it was sad when that was over. It was just like kind of it was really natural and and it happened real fast. Everyone just kind of bonded because you know we we started out with the underwater stuff. So um, we immediately just kind of clung together, you know, and uh, got to know each other real well. 